by pure coincidence, my next guest just happens to have the exact same book behind him as I do. Uh, you can't see this if you're listening to the podcast. I, no, of course not. It's no coincidence. He is the author of the wonderful new book, Preventing the Next Pandemic Vaccine Diplomacy in the Time of Anti-Science. And Dr. Peter J. Hotez is kind enough to join us on the Clam Pod. Dr. Hotez, welcome to the Clam Pod. Thanks so much for uh, having me, Greg. Great to see you. It, it's so great to have you on. I really enjoyed reading this book. And, and, and you know, so much about this book centers on vaccine diplomacy. And I love, you know, I think as someone who is very pro-science and has been very appreciative of vaccines throughout my lifetime, it has been incredible how much I have appreciated vaccines even more during this time of COVID. And I want to, before we get into vaccine diplomacy, though, I kind of want to just check in. You know, this has been an extraordinary year for you. You've obviously made uh, a ton of media appearances. You've been this great science communicator at this time. But at the same time, as you detail in the book, you've been working on a vaccine. You have been practicing science. You've been doing both the important science work, but also the important science communication work. So now that we're more than a year into this pandemic, what, what are some of your reflections on what this pandemic has been like for you, both per personally and professionally? Well, pretty exhausting because, as you said, um, I'm co-leading a team that's developing a COVID-19 vaccine, and that's being scaled up for production in India by Biological E, one of the big vaccine producers. It's now in phase three trials, so that's been more than full time, uh, something I do jointly with my a uh, long-standing science partner, Dr. Mary Elena Batazzi. <laughs> we've worked together for 20 years, and and now we've got we've been developing uh, vaccines for poverty-related neglected diseases like schistosomiasis and Chagas disease. And now we have this uh, also coronavirus vaccines we adopted about 10 years ago. Um, we started making vaccines for SARS and MERS in collaboration with the New York Blood Center and the Galveston National Lab. And so when the COVID-19 sequence came along, bam, we knew we, we could do this. And now um, hopefully this vaccine will make a difference. It's a low cost, older technology vaccine um, that uses the same technology as the hepatitis B vaccine that's been around for 40 years. So we're hoping that this can come fill the gaps because right now we're not vaccinating Africa and, and Latin America and the poor countries of Asia and the Middle East. So there's a real urgency for that. But then, um, because I've done a lot of uh, public engagement in the past um, that I've been talking on the cable news networks almost every day um, and sometimes several times a day and and then podcast and trying to communicate about COVID-19 and and in the middle of this writing papers and grants and doing all the things academics do and and um, and and the other piece to this is as you know there's been um, just like there's been a lot of climate denialism there's a huge anti-vaccine movement so I've been tracking the anti-vaccine movement for a number of years because I have a daughter with autism and my four adult kids and my youngest daughter has autism and intellectual disabilities. And the book before this one was called Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism, which made me sort of public enemy number one with the anti-vaccine group. So I've learned a lot about going up against anti-science movements. And that's something we probably, probably the two of us share in common. Maybe we can talk about that because anti-science has become a deadly force, just like, and, and it's been hard to convince people of that. I think this is... Um, to me, one of the really interesting things, but we'll talk about that. But in the bottom line is, you know, up up at 5 a.m. on Zoom calls and going to bed at 10 or 11 on Zoom calls and uh, and trying to stay sane and get some walking in and that sort of thing. But it has to be such a wild experience because you've had, as you mentioned, you've had this public career, you've made major contributions. In fact, you know, we had Catherine Coleman Flowers on the podcast last year. So, so this is the first time you've been on the podcast, but this is not the first time we've talked about you on the, right. the podcast. Now you're thrust and now you recognize you're in a position where you can make contributions to humanity and to the world at a scale that has to be extraordinary. I mean, just because of your discipline and what you're working on, I mean, what is that? What is that experience like? Yeah, no, it's um, you know, it's every academic dream to actually be relevant, and uh, <laughs> and so it's exciting, you know. As I like to say, I, 
I asked God for a big, interesting life and she delivered. So, <laughs> and, um, so, but, but sometimes it gets overwhelming as well. And, uh, because and it's, I mean, everybody's working hard. It's not that I'm unusual in that aspect. I think for me, the difference is the, it's the level of intensity because everything you do um, either has important implications for the vaccine you're producing that could reach billions of people, biologically is producing a billion doses. And we're hoping the Biden administration can also help us uh, with this as well. And, you know, when you're on CNN and MSNBC or BBC, you're talking to many, many people. And so you have to be careful what you say and be very measured what you say. And when you're writing about going up against anti-vaccine, anti-science movements, you know, the level of aggression is extraordinary. Um, and you're probably more used to it because of, you know, who you are and going up against all the anti, anti-science climate denialists. But, you know, the level of aggression has reached new levels. And and unlike, you know, when I started going up against anti-vaccine groups, you know, they were kind of grassroots organizations, but now they're well organized, they're well funded. Uh, you even have state actors. Now you have the Russian government. And uh, as you know, going up against the Putin Russian government is not always fun either. And not not to mention the, all the anti-vaccine groups that the Center for Countering Digital Hate, it's amazing we actually have an organization called the Center for Countering Digital Hate. Um, they're based in, in DC and London. They estimate 58 million followers from the data, dedicated anti-vaccine groups. And, and then now I think the other piece that you're, again, you're probably used to, but I'm not is, how um, the anti-vaccine movement was sort of a fringe element at the far right, among far right extremists. And I've been dealing with that, but now it's become more mainstream across the Republican party and the GOP. And that's just outright weird, you know, to have, you know, have the Fox News nighttime anchors, you know, going on anti-vaccine rants and that, that, and then members of the, a member of the US, members of the US Congress going on anti-vaccine rants and, um, uh, today there was, there was something with one of the members with, with, um, representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, that was just extraordinary, the things she was saying. So this has become a very, this has become a very dark time also of, and trying to figure, understand how you, how you manage it, I think to me has been a real struggle because, you know, as scientists train, you're trained to scientists, you're not supposed to talk about Republicans and right. Democrats, right? That's not polite or... And it's, it's, you know, you're not, you know, you're supposed to stay in your lane, just talk about the science, just talk about the science, but how else do you take the anti-science out of this conservative movement and this right-wing extremism if you don't call it out and, and report on it? And that's, and, and there's no roadmap for how you do that. So that, that's been really tough, especially, I think for me, the, the toughest time was um, last year um or or 14 months ago because um one i was trying to raise money for our vaccine that was hard work but also you know going up against anti-vaccine movements i'd become an sort of an expert of of sorts i don't know if there's any one real expert in this but become a bit of an expert in going in in the anti-science movements and i saw what the trump white house was starting to do you know and you saw you know members of the white house the West Wing staff, you know, say it's a Chinese conspiracy and and the COVID COVID doesn't really kill. The deaths are due to other causes, and the hospital admissions are due to catch up elective surgeries and all the garbage about hydroxychloroquine. I said, you know, I've seen this before, and then I realized this is an organized anti science disinformation campaign, and I was one of the first to call it out on, on national TV, not because I was so brilliant, but just because my years of going up against anti-vaccine groups sort of made me an expert of sorts. And that was a very scary time also, because, you know, that then I was seen as someone that could potentially, you know, derail, help, help derail the, the reelection of the president. And, and the the level of aggression on either on social media or my emails, which still hasn't stopped. If anything, it's gotten worse, uh, and, and and a lot of white nationalism stuff. And and uh, you know, an, an army of patriots is going to come hunt me down. And I'm thinking, well, why do you need an army of patriots? It's just 
it's just me and Anne and <laughs> and my special needs daughter and the cat. I would think one Patriot's enough or maybe two Patriots. We don't need a whole army of Patriots, but I joke about it, but it's it it's been it's been tough, no question about it. And we hear this from climate scientists. We, we talked to Dr. You know, Dr. Michael Mann's been on the podcast a few times. And he talks about the attacks he's had to face. And he talks about, hey, I never wanted to get into politics, like you mentioned. But one of the things that Dr. Mann has talked about in his book is just what you mentioned, which is how much social media has exacerbated, exacerbated this and how little has been done to stop it. And you identify you know, measures that Facebook could take, measures that Amazon could take to kind of slow down this anti-vax and anti-science movement. So what would you like to see some of the leading technology companies do to make sure this kind of misinformation isn't out there? Well, first of all, what I've done is I've identified so I wrote this as a, an essay in, in Nature uh, that came out uh, about two, three weeks ago. And um, and it basically says the anti-science movement around vaccines is a, is a three-headed monster. The the first one um, is, you know, this this shift to conservatism, conservatism and, and right-wing extremism and and linking to the white nationalists. That's that's one piece of this. The second are the the dedicated anti-vaccine groups of the center for countering digital hates has 58 million followers and and that's how extensive they are and then the russian government un, under putin and so what do you do and and the paper what it does is as i say look as as biomedical scientists you know we have no experience on how to deal with this and in, in, in the past the health agencies like cdc have always said you know peter you know, we're not going to call attention to this. It's just going to give it oxygen. And I'm saying it's got all the oxygen it needs. It's uh, this thing's on fire and um, it's a forest fire. And so basically what I recommend is to say, look, the health sector doesn't have the expertise to manage this. We now need to bring in people who have built infrastructure around global threats, who've built infrastructure around global terrorism or cyber attacks or nuclear proliferation and get some advice from them on how to do this and create some type of interagency task force maybe in the Biden administration or or the United Nations and 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 I tend to be an outlier on this one um that uh, because people just don't want to go there it's it's a scary place to go and and instead what you get a, a zoom call after zoom call how we're going to fine tune our message and amplify our message and I say look the message is a message in a bottle in the Pacific Ocean. This is this is a forest fire, and we've we need some new skill sets to know how to deal with it. And um, and so we'll see where it all goes. I, I do think that business as usual is not going to be adequate anymore. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Well, let's talk about some of the more uh, positive things of what we can do. You know, I, I love this concept of vaccine diplomacy. And again, it wasn't something that I was familiar with before reading the book, because obviously vaccines have this incredible healing power, but not, not to get too corny with it, but like vaccines have an incredible healing power when it comes to foreign relations and the way governments can work together and state actors can find uh, you know common ground and some, some ways to progress, even when there's like interstate tension. So if, I know, it's, I know it's always terrible to ask us to define something, but how would you define what you consider to be vaccine diplomacy and, and how and why it's so important? Well, there's two aspects. One, vaccine diplomacy is like what's going on now with the COVAX sharing facility to try to share vaccines globally. And that, that's a major piece. But the other and the one that I've been more actively involved in is how to build vaccines between two nations, um, even nations that don't necessarily agree ideologically. So the the idea um, was came for me out of Albert Sabin, who developed the oral polio vaccine. Many many people don't realize that in the fifties he didn't do this by himself, but actually did it jointly with the Soviets at the height of the Cold War. So he got permission to send his polio strains to the USSR, and his counterpart, Dr. Chumakov, um, worked with him, and that's where the vaccine was first scaled up. Uh, for an, an, an industrial scale. That's when it was first given to 10 million Soviet school children and shown to be safe and effective and now leading to the eradication of polio. So two countries putting aside their ideologies to work together for a, for a life-saving technology. And vaccines are so powerful and they can have such an impact as we've seen with COVID-19 that, that 
that's doable. So looking at how you use um, science and, and vaccines as an instrument of, of foreign policy and diplomacy. And we did this again with um, the eradication of smallpox. The Soviets collaborated with um, the, the US and the WHO. And so I've always wanted to practice this directly. And I got the opportunity in 2015, 2016, in the Obama administration, I served as US science envoy for the State Department and the White House. And that was very meaningful for me. I was sent to the Middle East and North Africa at a very difficult time at the height of the ISIS occupation and the Syrian conflict and recruiting all over Morocco and Tunisia um, for for young disenfranchised people for ISIS to talk about how we can build vaccines together. And, and I think it's very powerful. And I think now we can see why this is needed more than ever for COVID-19 because because we don't have the vaccines that are needed. No vaccines are made on the African continent right now. Um, very little in the Middle East, um, although I started that process. Um, very little in the Latin in the Latin American region. They're sort of underachieved. So there's too much dependent on the multinational companies. And now we've got to build that vaccine capacity. So it's something that I'm very passionate about doing. Yeah, you, you, as you mentioned, you have to build that vaccine capacity. But just as you talk about in the book, when you have areas that you worked in in the Middle East or North Africa, which have been conflict areas, that actually can drive the spread of disease. So how does conflict and war kind of have a neg negative impact on how disease is spreading? And climate change, it turns yeah. out. So, so um, you know, one of the examples in the book I give is on the Arabian Peninsula, where I was doing a lot of work as U.S. science envoy. I mean, here, you know, because of the wars and in, in because of the ISIS occupation, you had collapsed health systems in Syria and Iraq, and and also in Yemen because that proxy war between Iran and Saudi Arabia had, was starting, and and this was driving back disease, so polio, measles, vaccine-preventable diseases, but also a parasitic infection known as leishmaniasis, which is transmitted by sand flies with, um, the locals call it Aleppo evil because it, it causes a lot of disfigurement and the sand flies were, were proliferating in all the garbage and the uncollected garbage and all the destructive, all the destruction in, in Aleppo and other Syrian cities. But then there's there's another piece to that beyond war and political collapse, and that I know as you know better than anyone, there has been unprecedented temperatures uh, in this in the region of 50 degrees Celsius and drying up ancient agricultural lands in the along the Tigris and Euphrates, and then so people pouring into um, and there's drought and people pouring into cities, and that itself probably was a destabilizing force. That may, have, and, you know, some scholars, even their climate change experts, believe there was climate change and water shortages that may have helped to precipitate all of the conflict in the Middle East. So it really talks right. about how all of those pieces work together to to drive back uh, disease. And and I think one of the things that I found in the book, you know, learning about because I had to learn a lot about climate change for the book was from what I could see, it wasn't just climate change acting in isolation. It act it worked through other actors, whether it was poverty, you know, when you hear Al Gore talk about, um, you know, climate change, how um, people who live in poverty live in areas that are more susceptible to catastrophic weather events and, and that sort of thing, and, and war and political collapse. So it's this kind of perfect storm of social determinants together with climate change and anti-science now working together to, to bring back disease. So, and unfortunately we've had, you know, almost two decades of unprecedented global health gains because of the Gavi vaccine Alliance. And now there's been a bit of an unraveling for it. So that, you know, when I see COVID-19, I don't see that as most do, which is this unusual catastrophic event that appeared out of nowhere. I see it as a culminating event for declines that have been happening for several years now because of climate change, because of, war, political collapse, and uh, urbanization, and all the mega cities that are now forming. Uh, and, and it tries to describe that. And and I was a bit of a fish out of water because, you know, I'm a, I'm a vaccine scientist. I'm an MD, PhD laboratory investigator. You know, what do I know about poverty change or poverty or climate change or war and political collapse or urbanization? And I think that's another message of the book. You know, we're 
were trained too narrowly as biomedical scientists. You know, I never had a lecture. No one ever taught me about any of those things. And, and we don't teach it in graduate school or, or, or provided a postdoctoral training. And I think we have to revisit how we think about our specialties. We're, we're too narrow and we need to become more broadly trained to think about some of these things. Yeah, I was struck in the book how you talk about extreme poverty being one of these, or if, if not the biggest driver of how disease spreads. And you just talked about it with the extreme um, or the aggressive urbanization that you talk about in these mega cities. So we have, you know, these mega cities that may be forming in areas where they, they might have, uh, they might be more significantly impacted by climate change. So what could happen over the next couple of decades when it comes to public health that we should be concerned about? Well, what I, what I see is, you know, the you know the for the first time now, the the world's population is more urban than rural, and that trend is likely going to continue to accelerate. And it looks as though it's kind of coalescing into uh, mega cities. I, I'm thinking about, you know, how the stars were formed after the Big Bang, and everything blew up, and then everything sort of coalesced and form these uh, big gaseous clusters. Well, that's what we have now: these mega cities that are forming, of you know. Uh, more than 10 million. Um, and in the past, the, 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 the only mega cities were London, Tokyo, and Paris, but now they're Kinshasa and Dhaka and Bangladesh and, and Mumbai and, and Lagos and Nigeria or Sao Paulo. So they're all in, they're still more in the Southern hemisphere and in low and middle income countries. So they tend to be hot, sweltering, impoverished mega cities. And this is going to be the places where disease is going to going to flourish because we're outstripping the infrastructure that we have for things like sanitation and and healthcare infrastructure and you're you're seeing this play out in India right now where the healthcare system was fragile to begin with and we learned that and one of the things we learned in the US and New York and in South Texas is when when health systems get overrun, when ICUs get overrun, mortality shoots up, and that's happening on a mega scale now in all the big urban uh, mega cities of India uh, right now. And so we're getting a little glimpse of what life could look like in the coming coming decades. You know, a few years ago, uh, being someone who's far from an infectious disease expert and not really understanding the, the interplay between climate change and infectious disease, it did seem like when the Zika virus was happening and it was uh, in the news a lot that there was some overlap with climate change. Is, is climate change anyway, is it changing how diseases spread by mosquitoes and diseases like the Zika virus? Yeah, I think so. I think there's two pieces to, and I have a chapter on climate change in the book. And I, from what I could see, there's kind of two pieces. There's the the indirect effects from the things we were just talking about, also some direct effects as well. And but it's it's not as simple as I originally thought, which is that um, you know, for instance, my friend and uh, colleague Simon Hayes at the University of Washington, and he has made this amazing map of you talked about Zika of uh, mosquito transmitted viruses along the Gulf Coast and how that's going to continue to expand. So 80s 80s mosquitoes that transmit Zika. Uh, and also uh, uh, things like yellow fever and chikungunya, that's going to become more prominent. But that, there's also some paradoxical effects. So for instance, for one of the diseases that we're developing a vaccine for, schistosomiasis, it's transmitted by snails. And what you're seeing is in areas where um, drought and high temperatures are accelerating, it's even too hot for the snails that transmit the infection. So the disease so in some ways, it's actually melting away illness and, and disease. But in other places, um, and especially at higher elevations that historically have been too cold to support um, the life cycle of schistosomes, now you're starting to see it. And now you're starting to see schistosomiasis not only appear in Africa, but on the island of Corsica, um, uh, on, uh, 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 which is, which is you know, connected to France. So really interesting effect. So I think, you know, it's... It's not so simple as to say, well, everything's hotter and therefore it's going to promote uh, vector-borne disease. It, there's more complexity to that. And and uh, that was tough to articulate in, in a chapter. I think you could do a whole encyclopedia on what climate change is doing for, for disease vectors. So it gives the reader a bit of a glimpse into it. 
Another thing you give the reader a glimpse into is kind of your thoughts on, on the 2014-2015 Ebola epidemic. And you write, quote, the 2014-2015 Ebola epidemic in Africa illustrates many of the Anthropocene factors that are not now driving the 21st century epidemics on the Arabian Peninsula, Peninsula and in northern Nigeria. So what are some of those forces that, that are at play? Well, you know, this was uh, nicely articulated by my colleague Dan Dan Bausch, who's um, now in now in the UK. He was at Tulane University, and you know, he points out first of all, um, uh, the West Africa is far more urbanized than it's been before. You've got the the big uh, capitals in, in in Liberia and Sierra Leone and, and Guinea, um, but also now um, a lot of deforestation. So when people were fe- fleeing the conflict. They went deeper into remote rural areas where they're starting to cut down trees and and so deforestation is a big driver then people are coming of course into contact with bats and bats are the reservoir not only of coronaviruses but also ebola and so all of that allowed human contact um, in guinea um, and then they bring it back to Conquery and, and and the other urban areas, and then it continued to spread i mean this should not have been that hard to control i mean unlike COVID 19 where you have all these people who are asymptomatic and running around shedding virus, um, uh, another cohort getting sick, that Janus face of COVID-19 with Ebola, unless you're taking care of a dead or dying Ebola patient, you're not gonna get Ebola. It should not be that hard to, to contain. So it's pretty amazing that was able to spread as it, as it did. And, and, and that, that was an amazing story ultimately of how a uh, vaccine came along in 2019 uh, and when when it really took off in eastern DR Congo Democratic Republic of Congo and that was that was game changing that vaccine because um it i think it stabilized not only not only did it have high efficacy and help snuff out Ebola in eastern Congo but also i think stabilized the african continent it's one of the great public health stories that's not really been fully told As you mentioned, you know, the asymptomatic nature of so many COVID-19 patients has has been one of uh, the ways it's been so widespread and it's created this global pandemic. What has surprised you most about studying this disease and, and, you know, developing a vaccine for the disease? Well, you know, we developed SARS and MERS vaccines before, and and there it was more straightforward because if you had SARS or MERS, you, you were sick, right? You were not going to bars and restaurants and nightclubs and and you were either at home in bed or you were more likely you were in the hospital. It was a really severe illness. And that's why it never really took off. With COVID-19, the difference was people were shedding large amounts of virus uh, from their nose and mouth and as they were speaking. And and they had about half the individuals with no symptoms. And and another group that was getting very sick and going into ICUs. And this is you know that simple uh, that simple fact. You know is is one of the things that's made COVID nineteen so daunting to to control and um, and and when you have a virus that that's that that at that level of transmission, um, the only way you could really do anything about it um, ultimately is through vaccination, and that's why vaccinations were such a high priority. And you mentioned earlier the success of the vaccine diplomacy during the during this COVID pan, COVID-19 pandemic. In a post-COVID world, how do you think this will affect how nations work together on disease prevention and vaccine development? Well, one of the things I point out is it's, you know, we, we do learn from our pandemics. It's not like we don't do anything. So after SARS in 2002, 2003, we created international health regulations, IHR 2005, that that created a system of better governance around pandemics. And then after H1N1 in 2009, uh, President Obama put in the global health security agenda with WHO and after Ebola, that's when CEPI formed the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation to help finance new vaccines. So with each, each epidemic, there are incremental steps. I think for this one, I think there's a few things we're gonna need to do. We're gonna have to really rev up uh, vaccine diplomacy 
in the sense of building infrastructure and training people how to make vaccines. Again, it's not just the bricks and mortars, the factories. It's that's actually the least of it. It's the it's the human capital training people because vaccines are very com are complex biologics. So it can take years to know how to make vaccines and and it requires specialty training and not only just training in the science, but also the quality control and quality assurance and national regulatory authority. So it's a decade long project, at least to build up vaccine development capacity in the Middle East and Africa and Latin America. So I think that's gonna be a, a top priority. So we're not so dependent on the multinationals because sometimes they'll come through, sometimes they won't. It's not that they, you know, I mean, the reason we can vaccinate the world is the multinationals have stepped up to provide vaccines for Africa, um, for measles vaccines and that sort of thing. But we still, for new vaccines, we can't rely only on the multinational pharmaceutical companies. We need uh, that kind of local infrastructure uh, across, the, across the world, especially in low and middle income countries. And then we've got to do something about the anti-science to bring it back to that. I mean, as I like to say, the reason 600,000 Americans died of COVID-19 was partly due to the SARS coronavirus type two. It was an equal measure due to defiance, defiance right. of masks and social distancing and, and vaccines. It was death by anti-science. And we have to recognize what a potent force that is. So that's going to be the other thing I think we've really got to figure out how to address. Well, how has that anti-vaccine movement started to globalize? Is it through social media? Is it through these political action committees that you talk about in the book? Like, where are you seeing the biggest movements, you know, to, to make this spread just throughout, not, not outside of the United States, throughout the entire world? Well, I think the difference is what I'm seeing now is that same U.S. style anti-vaccine movement is, is popping up in other parts of the world. So, for instance, in in last year and last summer in Berlin and Paris and, and London, you had anti-mask, anti-vaccine rallies. And they used some of the same health freedom, medical freedom language that was coming out of the political right uh, in the United States. They even stormed the Reichstag, just like, just like storming the Capitol. Um, and so that, and then the, the New York Times uh, BBC reported that was linked to QAnon in Europe um, and, and the German equivalent of, of QAnon. So that's that was really telling for me. And then what the Russians are doing with what's being what's sometimes termed weaponized health communications, destabilizing democracies by using vaccines, anti-vaccines as a wedge issue, um, and that's been extremely damaging. And then. Um, the reports from uh, Nova, uh, Novatella, I think it's called, um, that um, it's an analytics firm that reported that uh, the Russians are now actively discrediting COVID-19 vaccines made in the West in favor of Sputnik V, their own mm -hmm. COVID vaccine. So this has caused a lot of devastation. Um, and and figuring out ways to tackle it, I think, is going to be a top priority and how we communicate science. I think that's the other message that that I've seen is, um, you know, we don't get we don't we're not training scientists to, to talk, to communicate to the public. Um, you know, when I was when I was getting my MD and PhD in New York in the 80s, you know, the message was, you know, you're not supposed to talk to the public or or journalists that was seen as a form of self promotion or grandstanding and and all of those ideas that were developed over decades were before something called the internet came along. And I think the world has changed dramatically. And now I think we've got to fix this. I think we need to, tra tra to train in our doctoral and postdoctoral education about science communication, how to do it. I mean, I had to learn through trial and error, unfortunately more error than trial probably, but, but um, um, and, um, and there's a way to do it. And I think, and, and one of the things that I've found is the way we're often told to communicate science is completely wrong. I think, you know, we've got, you know, one of the big mistakes I think the White House Coronavirus Task Force did was somebody told them in communication school or professional communications people, you have to talk to the American people like they're in the fourth grade or the sixth grade. And it's not true. Um, one of the things that I've learned, you know, talking on the cable news networks every day and on podcasts like this and 
radio is people are actually willing to tolerate a pretty high level of complexity. Um, and they're doing it because their lives depend on it and the lives of their loved ones depend on it. And, and I find that people like hearing from scientists um, and they like, they like the nuance. They like the um, uh, individualistic opinions as well, provided you disclose that this is not dogma. And, I, and that's one of the things I try to do. I say, look, here's, here are the facts as I know them, and now I'm going to offer an opinion. And it's just an opinion, and there are many good scientists who disagree with me. So let me give you an example. I just did this uh, today. I was on... Um, uh, MSNBC and then CNN yesterday talking about the origins of COVID-19 and um, saying that, um, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not very impressed with the evidence that it has a laboratory origin or it's a laboratory leak and, and here's why. And then I say, so, but there are many, many excellent scientists who, who make good arguments to the contrary. Uh, people like that. People like the honesty, the and they see that as authenticity as well. Or, I'll say, you know, people ask me, well, are, you, are we going to need COVID nineteen vaccines every year, a new booster? And I say, no, I don't think so, because I'm seeing evolutionary convergence around the variants. I think if we give a third immunization of the Moderna or Pfizer vaccine, that may be it for a while. But I'll say, on the other hand, the Pfizer CEO has announced that that they're looking into combining COVID-19 vaccines with flu vaccines because they think it's going to be every year. And so being able to explain that there's not always consensus in the scientific community, I think people like to hear that as well. And they and, and, and in the past, you would say, no, 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 you can't do that. You know, people won't, people will freak out if they hear there's disagreement in the scientific community. No, they don't. They, but you just, it's just how you message it and how you explain it. Yeah, I want to follow up because you mentioned that the story. I think it, this is this stemmed from that Wall Street Journal story, right, about researchers and the Wuhan um, virology lab. Was, you said you went on MSNBC to talk about you. You're not convinced by the evidence. I, I really haven't looked into my, it, any of this much. So, what are you or what are you seeing that does not have you convinced well, that you're not well, getting enough good information? Everyone's looking, you know, thinking that uh, because there were three scientists from the lab that went to the hospital in November, that's the smoking gun. Well, first of all, the Chinese are denying it, but who knows about that. Um, but, you know, if, if you remember the in the South China, well, you probably weren't following it that closely, but in the South China Morning Post last year around this time, they had identified what they thought was patient ground zero, uh, was right. a 55 year old woman from Hubei province in on November 17th. So. So that was already out there that this thing was beginning in November. And then you know, my, my colleague, uh, John Brownstein, who's at, at, at Harvard Medical School, he did this really interesting analysis uh, following um, the increase in febrile cases and, and diarrheal disease and pulmonary disease that, that showed a sharp increase starting around August of 2019 so it chance you know there's a possibility it could have started much sooner so uh and then i said you know the the only way to know is to be able to send a team of scientists in and do a pretty comprehensive investigation it's going to mean um taking blood samples virus isolates from wild animals like bats um also domestic agricultural animals livestock uh also um uh, laboratory animals and and people, and doing in depth interviews with the scientists in Wuhan. Whether the Chinese will ever allow it, because the transparency is not the strength of the Chinese government, um, is is unclear. But that's the only really way to get to the bottom of it. Otherwise, I think you know you're just looking at kind of bits and pieces. And I right. really could argue it either way. So I tend to favor that it's probably of natural origins. But I don't rule it out. I, I think it's possible. It's plausible. But you don't have to postulate that because we already know China is the perfect mixing bowl of. Um, and if you, I used to do a lot of work in China during the 1990s, we were uh, funded. We worked mostly on parasitic infections. Actually, most of my 
um, scientific work is on vaccines for parasitic diseases, not necessarily viruses. And so we used to work all over China at the based at the Institute of Parasitic Diseases in Shanghai. And you go into these agriculturally rich areas like in Hubei province and you know where you what what would you see you'd see this vast mixing bowl of chickens and ducks and pigs and now you've got bats and you know it's and then high density populations and it's 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 everything you need to to uh, have disease arise and that's why SARS came out of southern China in 2002 that's why we looked at China for avian influenza it's because of that mixing bowl so when you know that situation is already the baseline, you know, why, why do you have to necessarily postulate something extraordinary like a lab accident? It's right. not that it's impossible, but you don't, I, you can make a coherent story about it without invoking it. And that's one of the things you learn as a scientist. If it's, um, if, if you have an obvious mechanism, you know, it, you have to justify why you're looking for something unusual or extraordinary. It doesn't mean it's not true, but, um, but I, but I think you have to be careful and measure it. And as I say, the only way you're really going to know is doing that in-depth investing. And then, you know, it, then people say, aha, but there's this furin cleavage site in the SARS-2 coronavirus that you didn't see in SARS-1. Well, you know, the, and that made it more, it made it easier for uh, the virus to infect cells and replicate. Well, the furin cleavage sites were found with the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus on the Arabian Peninsula. So... You know all of the things that people say it to me it's not it's not persuasive um it doesn't mean it's not true but it's not yet persuasive so i i think you know we still have to push for doing an international team of an investigative team and that's the only way we're really going to pin it down but you're talking about doing all the really good work and, and all the really hard work and what i worry about is rhetoric around international relations may ramp up in a way that hurts vaccine diplomacy. We already saw the Trump administration, some of their rhetoric around China can really be harmful. And so I worry in a post COVID world that we could Well, that's have- what you had, right? I mean, you had Peter Navarro, you know, I remember, you know, I, I was on, I think MSNBC and he came out with this wild stuff that this was a communist, Chinese Communist Party plot and the Chinese were deliberately sending infected people into, the U.S. in order to spread COVID-19, and it reminded me when I was a kid, I used to watch this show called Hawaii Five-O, the old Hawaii Five-O, and every now and then they'd have uh, this man from China named Wo Fat in a little submarine, and he would come up and, you know, cause a lot of mayhem in, in, uh, in, in Hawaii, and I said, this, what is this guy saying? I mean, he's just this crazy conspiracy theories, and people accept it. People seem to want to believe conspiracies more readily than they want to take the time to understand subtlety and, and nuance and it did a lot of damage and and I you know the anti-science um, activities of this last administration are, are still with us and and now we've um, um, and now the other thing that concerns me are the attacks on the scientists um, you know they go after Tony and 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 Tony Fauci and me and and others and it's it's scary. Um, and I have a paper that came out of Plus Biology called Anti Science Kills and and I talk about the story of the Great Purge at the time of Stalin when he tried to do away with scientists and not that it's as bad as Stalin of course but but you know there's something resembling it going on right now and. And this is this is a really important time for science to I think scientists to take more control of defending what they do and to be more out there um, saying no we're not going to allow this anti science rhetoric and we can't uh, simply delegate it to the journalists and 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 others for us we're going to have to fight some of that battle ourselves I think well this is you're seeing a relationship between the anti-vax movement and nationalism. And nationalism is something that scares the hell out of people who are interested in, climate, in combating climate change and environmental destruction, because we've seen, especially in Europe, some nationalism re um, rhetoric around protecting the environment, all these like perverse ways of taking climate action and kind of turning it on, on its head and in ways that are really scary and destructive. So, do, so you are, are you seeing- Which, which by the way, when you, you know, when you think about it, it's, 
it, it takes time to explain because intuitively it's not obvious why something like nationalism or or white nationalism should be connected to anti-science and it's and one of the things i do in the book and and i'm doing it more now because it's becoming more prominent is kind of explaining the historical thread of that um so you know this concept began out of texas and oklahoma around 2015 under this con you know the anti-vaccine movement was floundering in part because scientists like myself were debunking a lot of the vaccine autism links and i wrote that book vaccines not cause rachel's autism and so the anti-science movement needed to re-energize re and they they found a home uh, with the Republican Tea Party under this banner of health freedom, medical freedom. You know, you can't tell us what to do with our kids. This was around childhood vaccination. They formed political action committees, anti-science, anti-vaccine political action committees in Texas and Oklahoma. And then the wheels came off in 2020 because the that anti-vaccine movement then glommed on protests against masks and social distancing. And then it became mainstream across the GOP. And and it's so tragic and so self-defeating. One of the things I point out is, you know, the Republican Party historically was not anti-science. I mean, Lincoln started the National Academy of Sciences and and Eisenhower launched NASA and George W. Bush launched PEPFAR. So how this happened and how he fix it and walk it back, I think is going to be one of the great challenges for us. Absolutely. I just want to just to wrap up here. You were talking about Texas. I know you live work in Texas and in Texas serves as um, an example in your book. You write, quote, Texas represents one of America's most extreme examples of diseases of the poor amid wealth. And this is something that we're seeing across the country. When we were talking in, uh, earlier about the work that you've done with Catherine Coleman Flowers, what are what is happening in Texas and how does this relate to the way you're seeing disease spread across the country and across the world? Well, one of the things that I that that's fun for me, actually, you know, when I go on the, the cable news networks, et cetera, is the fact that I'm from Texas. You know, when people, th you know, because we have such a terrible reputation in flyover nation, meaning that, and you are, you're in flyover nation also, right? So you're in Indianapolis, right? So the, um, you know, it's everything is so East Coast or West Coast centric. You know, what's this guy doing from Texas? You know, people don't realize Texas has made incredible investments in science and scientific institutions. So I'm at the Texas, I mean, I came to Texas for the science, for the, to be part of this extraordinary Texas Medical Center. And my science has, has really flourished here. I mean, I've written more papers in the last 10 years in Texas than the last, than all my previous career in new vaccines. And now I've become a writer too. So it's been intellectually very stimulating place. Houston's been fabulous. But there's other sides to Texas as well. There's um, even and there's even though there's great wealth and philanthropy, there's also extreme poverty at, at at a depth and breadth that I didn't know existed in the U.S. I thought living in Washington, because before this I was chair of microbiology at GW, I thought I knew what poverty looked like in Washington. This is a different animal. I mean, the 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 profound level of poverty here looks like what. I would have seen working, you know, across the world's low and middle income countries. And that stimulated me to write uh, one of my earlier books called Blue Marble Health, finding diseases of the poor amid wealth that are actually incredibly common. Um, so you have that side of Texas, and then you have all the extremism, uh, you know, that not so much in Houston, which is a pretty liberal city, but more when you get outside of Houston and, and, and other parts. And and I find it really interesting, and 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 I, and I actually like talking to people who don't necessarily agree with me or think, you know, think in different ways of uh, what I do, but um, it, there could be there's some minefields there as well. Absolutely, and I and believe me, as someone living in flyover country in Indiana, I certainly did not miss the reference to Purdue University in your book. So Dr. Hotez, <laughs> really appreciate that. And then you talk about, uh, you know, the, the value of public university, the value of institutions that are working on the things exactly that you're talking about. Yeah, yeah my, favorite, my favorite story that I wrote about in the book, you know, I was at one of these uh, diwaniyas, uh, um, which are, you know, in Saudi Arabia, you know, they often separate the men and women. So in the night, you know, in the evening, the men gather for coffee and they tea and they're telling stories. and. And I was at one of these Diwaniyas speaking, uh, representing the U.S. government at a time when President Trump, 
you know, that earlier that day had, you know, said terrible things about Muslims. And I said, oh, crap, what am I going to do? I mean, hey, I remember the U.S. government. And and one of the guests asked me about it. And I said, oh, man. And then, but the host then stepped up. and said, oh, Peter, don't worry about it. We know this is BS. Um, I, you know, I did my Ph.D. at Iowa State University. And I lived with a family in Ames, Iowa for five years. I know what the real America is like. And that's the, and then the light bulb went on. I said, boom, you know, that's it. You know, our research universities are probably our greatest ambassador and not even just the MITs and Stanford's of the world, but, you know, the Iowa States or, you know, Indiana University in Bloomington. I mean, we're, you're, we're training um, people, thought leaders all over the world at our land grant universities, our universities across the Midwest and the South. And these, these are our great treasures that we need to preserve. And, and we need to do a better job of promoting this whole cadre of science ambassadors, I think. Well, and I, th I think about that and the climate capacity. If, if, we, if the United States is doing more, and we're doing, doing a lot, and there's so many great innovators, but if we're doing more to de help decarbonize the world, and make these contributions. Obviously, we're a big contributor to global emissions. If we're making these contributions that has such a beautiful intergovernment foreign relations benefits as well. And I was thinking about that reading about vaccine diplomacy. Yeah, well, science diplomacy, in my you know, from the time I've been doing it, is probably the least shaped, least um, well thought of aspect of US foreign policy. Um, but it could be potentially among the most powerful. I think we, you know, why do people think America is a great nation? It's, it's our research universities and our institutions and our innovation. And, but we don't put it out there as much, you know, for the world. And I think we've got to, I think there's an, op there's a missed opportunity there. Well, I just truly enjoyed the book. Again, it's preventing the next pandemic vaccine diplomacy and the time of anti-science. And Dr. Hotes, thank you. So I know you're incredibly busy. Thank you so much for your time and all the incredible work you're doing. As you know, just as, as a simple podcaster like myself, this is incredibly inspiring. So thank you so much for spending the time tonight. Well, just don't call yourself a simple podcaster because what you're doing is communicating science, right? To to the world. And and you know, if it's pretty clear now that there's probably nothing more important at this time. So thank you for thank you for all your great work.